Silence your cell phones and your mouths. study. Um, somehow or other, I got the uh, announcements moved, so we'll do that after. I want to sh share this little creation minute from the Institute for Creation Research. Is evolution a requirement for innovation? In the 19th century, the theory of abiogenesis was widely accepted, much like evolution is today. Charles Darwin strongly promoted this idea that life was generated by non-life. However, Louis Pasteur, a French microbiologist and believer in biblical creation, made a startling discovery. In the early 1860s, he conducted experiments comparing organic material that was directly exposed to air to organic material that was not directly exposed to air. And the result? Nothing grew in the vessels that were not directly exposed to air and airborne microbes. This confirmed biogenesis, meaning life always comes from life. Pasteur declared, never will the doctrine of spontaneous generation recover from the mortal blow struck by this simple experiment. His studies led to the practices of sterilization and pasteurization, particularly in the areas of medicine and food preparation. Along with German physician Robert Koch, he shares the title of the father of germ theory and bacteriology, having conducted experiments supporting the theory that germs cause disease. Pasteur went on to research the rabies virus, developing a non-virulent vaccine that in 1885 saved a nine-year-old boy who had been bitten by a rabid dog. And when anthrax was destroying entire flocks of sheep in France, Pasteur successfully vaccinated them against the disease. Must a person believe in evolution to be an innovating scientist? Louis Pasteur's life clearly showed the answer is no. With a known belief in biblical creation, Pasteur was an innovator whose work set the foundation for some of the most important advances in our modern world. That's uh, Institute for Creation Research. ICR.org, I think, is their website. ICR.org, great uh, information there. We got some of their videos over here. And go ahead and get into our announcements. Uh, Wednesday night, we're going to have Dirt Dutch and Fried Chicken. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Welcome. And then Sunday, Brother Stephen is going to fire up the tailgate. He hasn't been in here once. Yeah, I hope he re he re his wife will have to remind him because he's never in here for an announcement. But uh, after the, immediately after the Sunday service, just like always with the the uh, uh, potluck, or whatever you call it, but uh, he will you know need a few minutes to fire up the meat. So you know you can go downstairs. We'll give give the ladies five or ten minutes to get everything set up, and then go down and start getting your plates. And by then the the meat will it doesn't take long. Some of the meat we'll probably have will be pre-cooked and just have to be grilled for taste. Yeah, so. Yeah, side dishes, desserts, that sort of thing. Um, October 10th then, uh, Brother John Alba will be teaching on Wednesday night. Then the 19th, we have a movie night scheduled, Friday night 7. And we're going to try to have a work party on the 27th. There is no Buckeye game that day, so... Most of you don't have a life outside of that anyway, so just uh -oh. join us. And then on October 31st, wow. Brother Johnny Alba is going to come to church. It's, it's Halloween night, and uh, he's going to put his Christian liberty to work 
<laughs> and come as Ronald McDonald. Yes. Wow. Feel free to dress up anything non-satanic, <laughs> and uh, we'd prefer nothing gruesome or gory. But uh, you can pretty much come anytime. Some of you look like you dressed up this morning for Halloween. <laughs> Come anytime you want. Dress up as uh, something. Yeah, Charlie. Charlie didn't dress up. That's really what he looks like. So, so no comments. Ramon, he came as a door-to-door -door salesman today. <laughs> uh, all right. So anyway, all right. We're gonna get into our Bible study. Colossians chapter two is where we'll be, and I want to open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord. For this time in your word, we thank you for everyone able to be with us this morning, and for those who couldn't be with us, be with them. And we just ask, Lord, you help us to understand this book. Amen. And uh, we just thank you. Good, really good time in Sunday, open Bible discussion and Sunday school hour, and uh, great job of Brother Stephen this week. Amen. Just thank you for each week. It's just been good. And we just pray now that you help us in our study of Paul's epistle, epistle to the church in Colossae, in our King James Bible. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 that I'm aware of is that on a daily average, um, 3,500 human beings are murdered in their mother's womb. And they are dismembered, burned, and liquefied. It's an ugly, ugly murder of children. Yes. And it's done in the name of choice by the very uh, wicked left wing in this country, basically. Yeah. And uh, turn my microphone. Can you hear me? I'll make sure you can hear me out there. There you go. Uh, and um, these attacks that you're seeing on Judge Kavanaugh, you need to understand that anything to do with him. And they're demonic actions of wicked people who are fighting to defend Roe v. Wade. And they believe that if Kavanaugh is confirmed, then um, he would vote with the majority to overturn Roe. And so just keep that in mind. You see everything going on with Kavanaugh right now. It doesn't have anything to do with Kavanaugh. It's about the right to murder. And uh, they I'm just going to tell you flat out, a lot of the men in this country don't have a spine anymore. Yeah. They won't speak the truth. Christine Blasey Ford is full of crap. Amen. And anybody stupid enough to believe that she's legit, you need your brain examined. Amen. And she sat there with her little 15-year-old cry voice and wasn't able to produce a single tear. She doesn't know when it happened or where. And this is how evil the left wing is in this country. Yeah. You need to understand, if you get in their way, they will try to destroy you. Yeah. Some of us have dealt with it in our lives. Some of us have dealt with it in, at, on, in the workplace. Yeah. And... Uh, you just have, you need to understand the real world you're dealing with. You decide especially to get into politics and you don't go with the left wing, you better get ready. They will try to destroy you. Amen. And uh, over the years, a lot of conservatives didn't understand that. And they thought they could be buddies with these people and it cost Amen. them. But in more important news, Kanye West has announced that his new name is Ye. Just so you know that. I know huh? a lot of you like to keep up with Kanye. He's all about Ye. Yeah, it's his new name, Ye. You remember how Prince became a symbol and he was the artist formerly known as Prince? Well, Ka uh, Kanye West is now Ye. He's the artist formerly known as Kanye West. Sure so I just thought you'd be interested in knowing that. <laughs> yeah, Johnny? Shouldn't, shouldn't his new name be pronounced Ye? <laughs> Kanye. Yeah. Well, maybe he, will. He, he just put it on Twitter and it said, I am Ye. That's his new name. You're probably right. Huh? But yeah, that matches with his It was just in the news. I just found about it in the news this morning, so if it happened before. He called himself Jesus. Oh, Jesus. 
Well, at least now he's not as blasphemous about it. Was on the time the cross. Yeah. So he did it legally, or he's just declaring this? Dre? Uh, going back to that Kavanaugh uh, thing, you got too many people say, oh, we should believe the woman, uh, we can believe the accuser. No, we can believe the accuser was there's evidence. Yeah. You believe women, they say, you believe women. No, most women are liars. Most women are liars. Most men are liars too. We have to always put the disclaimer in, but we're talking about women. And most women are liars, and I even add they're stupid. <laughs> and so if you've dealt with a couple hundred women in your lifetime, you know that most of them are liars or stupid or both. So you don't believe any woman, you don't believe any man, unless, as Dre said, there's evidence. Innocent until proven guilty. That's right. Yeah, Ramon? You have to have your mom update you on that uh, later on. But the uh, Yeah, it wasn't a trial. But uh, innocent until proven guilty isn't just a legal precedent. That is a that's an American uh, presumption that is toward anybody in any situation. Right. It wasn't a trial. And it didn't have anything to do with Kavanaugh at the protecting abortion. So, anyway, keeping you up on Kanye and the rest of the important things. Speaking of, speaking of ye, ye are complete in him. And I'm not talking about Kanye. See how I segued that in? Some of you are sitting there thinking, why is he talking about Kanye? <laughs> oh, lighten up. <laughs> Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. And uh, we're going to read verse 9 and 10 just for context. But uh, instead of worldly philosophy and tradition, we find our meaning in Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's read verses 9 and 10 of Colossians 2. Read with me. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. And we're going to kind of zone in on that first portion of verse 10. And ye are complete in Him. Amen. And uh, sadly, uh, most believers fail to understand what we are in Him. Uh, and, and it's just a strange thing over the years I've seen when I have talked on this subject I, I've kind of picked up on and I'm not picking up on it right now at least yet but in the past I picked up on it like oh this is you know Sunday school material and Martha's lost what are, what are we doing okay oh. okay just, just one of the people out there to know that nothing wrong with your uh, cameras or your video no, your, your computers <laughs> All right, um, but as I said, we, we discuss what we are in Him. Let's talk about you being in Christ, in Jesus. And people just kind of blow this off as though it's just grade school, Sunday school material, when the reality is, um, I found most Christians do not know these things. And the, here's what the problem is. A lot of Christians seem these days to either do one of two things. Uh, on the one hand, they're only really concerned with what God can do for them in their wallet. There's a whole segment of professing Christianity today, and I'm not just talking about the word faith charismatics, by the way. There's a whole segment of Christianity where it's all about finances. Yeah. And all about money. Yeah. Now, I'm not, I didn't say we shouldn't know what the Bible says about finances and money. What I'm saying is, is if that's your focus, you're out of focus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and I, it, but it does need to be said that this whole blab it and grab it thing is also unbiblical <laughs> just as much. Amen. And, uh, but then there's the other side who is into all supernatural, but it's, it doesn't have anything to do with their supernatural relationship with the Lord. It has to do with the world of the supernatural and spooky things. And even Bible prophecy, as much as you know I love 
I think all Christians should love Bible prophecy, Amen. but Amen. but to have this overemphasis on it, where they just always want to know what's you know the latest thing coming down the pike, and the hair stand up on the bed, and if it's not that, then they just zone out. And I am not going to name names or anything like that, but I could tell you story after story of a person like that because when I've known them through the years, they fall off the wagon. Yeah. Because at some point, that stuff, because that's not what it's all about, that stuff will begin to just leave you empty. It'll leave you with a... How many of you woke up in the middle of the night just parched, needing something to drink? Yeah. I mean, it happens, and it's kind of aggravating. And because you, you got to get up, you don't want to. You're like, ah, oh, maybe I'm just choking my way through this. <laughs> and you got to get up. You know, and then if you're my age, then an hour later you got to get up again. Amen? You know what I mean? My age and older. But um, that's the way it is with these, these folks with their, uh, if we compare getting a good night's rest to having rest in the Lord, having joy in the Lord and everything. They, they, are, they, they just can't. And it's like they just cannot be satisfied. With what the Lord has for him. And I want you, to, I just have to mention that as we get into this study. If we're going to live a life of joy and victory, we must know who we are in Christ. Amen. It's just that simple. If you, how many of you want to be bummed out all the time? Raise a hand. I see that hand. <laughs> now, the truth is, I know people who do. I know people who enjoy, as a preacher one time, and I heard this story, I believe it's true. Preacher got up and he was a guest speaker and he had his wife with him. And he says, yes, I'd like to introduce my wonderful wife who has enjoyed 60 years of bad health. It'll take a few minutes for some of you. Enjoyed 60 years of bad health. Miserable, being miserable. They, people love being miserable. Miserable. How many people you go out to? How you doing? Oh, rheumatism. Oh, my back. Oh, how many you know people like that? No. Come on now. No. And I'm and you, not me. I'm not talking about me. I don't. I don't always complain. <laughs> but I tell people that you know I I, I don't want to even talk about it because I don't want to be complaining all the time. Because <laughs> some of us have what we call chronic health issues yeah. and so we just rather not that we're going to lie to you but we just would rather not always give you the, the lowdown on all breaks and pains mm -hmm. but there are some people who enjoy doing that i've uh, somebody in my uh, i'll just say in my circle of friends and we it was a kind of a joke and we always said the one thing you never ask is how are you doing because <laughs> they would tell you <laughs> And some people love that. But for those of us who want to experience joy, how many of you like victory? Amen. Isn't it nice being a Buckeye fan? Amen. I mean, you, you know what victory tastes like. Amen. <laughs> There's Pennsylvania teams, pray for them. <laughs> or if you're an Ohio football fan and you have a professional team that you root for, you don't know what victory tastes like very often. <laughs> just for the record, today is September 30th of 2018, and the Browns had just won the first game in, what, three years or something like that? <laughs> yeah. wow. How many of you want your Christian life to be like being a Browns fan? <laughs> Amen? I don't. And before we jump in here, we also need to differentiate between two things, practical and positional. Uh, you'll hear people say, well, that, I practically this, or I practically that. Practically means practice, what you practice. It used to be the churches would uh, put right out there for everybody to know their statement of faith and practice. Now they hide it. They don't want anybody to know they stand for anything. Mm -hmm. But they used to be right out there. Yeah. And it, we've got our statement, and I'm wanting to get one printed up just so it'll be here for people to look at. But your faith is what you believe. Your practice is, it's not like practicing baseball or football or practicing, you know, guns, shooting. or It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's what you actually do. And so there's truths that are true about you in a practical sense of 
your daily life. There are also truths that may not even be obvious to you with your flesh and your eyes, but they are true positionally. Uh, Brother Stephen was talking this morning. Where did he go? What happened now? Uh, <laughs> I just noticed he did. Uh, he was talking about this morning that, you know, there are, uh, you know, things that are true about us that we don't necessarily, uh, you know, see, but it's still true. We kind of got into that a little bit this morning. But practical and positional, those are the two things. Keep that in mind. So the first thing I want to discuss with all my brethren and sister is that in Christ, if you're saved this morning, if you're saved, you are in Christ. And if you're in Christ, then you are righteous. Amen. Do you know that? Amen. Philippians 3, 9 says, And be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. See, uh, there, are, there are too many religious people who think that they're going to be righteous by what they do. That's not how it works. As a matter of fact, if you get this thing right, what you understand is you are righteous because of what Christ did and any righteousness that we see in you is because of what He's doing in you. Even the good things you do with the right motive, you don't deserve the credit for God's the one doing it in you. All you're doing is letting God work. Amen? Amen? Here's how it looks on a little chart I made. You're down here. Jesus went to the cross. Amen. Our sins and iniquity were laid on Him. Amen. He paid the price that only He could pay. Amen. Again, Stephen talked about this this morning. That only Jesus could have paid for our sins. None of you could have died for your sins or mine. Amen. No human being who ever lived could have died for our sins. Amen. No angel could have died for our sins. The Jehovah's Witnesses teach you Jesus is Michael the archangel. Well, then He couldn't have died for our sins because angels are created. The only one who could have died for the sins of the whole world is the one who created us. Amen. The uncreated, only begotten Son of God, who is infinite, without ending, without ending, who is holy and without sin, He went to the cross, died for our sins, and that is why when He died for our sins, it was a payment that covered us all. Amen. But if He had not been God manifest in the flesh... He could not have died for his own sins, let alone yours and mine. That's what's crazy about all the cults who deny his deity and say he's not God. Mm -hmm. So his righteousness then becomes our righteousness by faith. Mm -hmm. When you repent toward God, you're saying, I'm no longer going to rely on me being a good person. And I am going to turn away from those sins. I have a heart change. I don't want to live in sin. I don't want to commit sins. I understand I am a sinner. I am repenting totally toward God mm -hmm. with faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ, believing on His death, burial, and resurrection for eternal life. And at that moment, you understand the moment you were saved, that moment, His righteousness was imputed onto your account. Amen. And since that day when God has looked at you, thank God He doesn't see you. Amen. He sees Jesus. Hallelujah. That's why you're, it says you're in Christ. You're literally, think of it that way, in Christ. And when God looks at you, He sees Jesus, not you. Amen. Thank you Therefore, Jesus. He doesn't see your sin. He sees the perfection of His Son. Amen. He sees the righteousness of His Son. Mm -hmm. That's why He bothers to even listen to you when you pray. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't even bother to listen. The only prayer, I believe the only prayer that God is attentive to when it comes from an unsaved man or woman is, 
a prayer once they're saved. Mm -hmm. Until they're saved, he's not listening. The Bible says that. We don't have time to run all the references. Look them up this week. That God does not listen to the wicked. That's right. Now, of course, he doesn't, doesn't mean he's deaf for them and he doesn't hear what they say at all. But to listen in this sense is he doesn't receive what they say. He doesn't take it in and respond to it. Mm -hmm. But if you're his child, he looks down and you're talking, but he sees Jesus. And therefore, he responds. Mm -hmm. He doesn't always say yes. <laughs> so sometimes he'll say no, just like a good dad does to the kids. Right. Yeah, Doug? Too many people uh, at, at work in different places like that, when I used to work, uh, they, they would, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. And then they would, uh, and I said, you got to be happy. I mean, you should be. be. You should be have, have joy in that. Amen. Nothing there. Just... Amen. And that basically is what it means to walk in the flesh. And you won't walk in the Spirit, you don't enjoy your salvation. You know, you can be saved and not enjoy it. Mm -hmm. You can be happy with what, what He's done for us. The psalmist said, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. He didn't say restore unto me my salvation at that time. No. The joy. So practically, on a, in a practical sense, we still sin. Mm-hmm. And there are people who want to argue with you, and if they say they don't sin, they're sinning right there because they're lying. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now, it's not that we wake up every day and say, well, let's get this over with and just go sin. <laughs> but it means that you're still a fallen creature, and you will still sin. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just like, uh, you know, you don't want to trip and fall. But I'll guarantee you, especially the older you get, you're going to trip, you're going to fall. Mm -hmm. You're going to stumble. Mm -hmm. uh, but it doesn't mean you can't walk. It just means you will stumble. So there's Christians should live lives that are pleasing to the Lord. And we can avoid sin. And we can sin less, but we just won't be sinless. There's a space between sin and less. We, we, we should sin space less. But we, we are not going to be sinless. Not in this life. The one to come. So positionally, though, positionally, right now, everybody who's saved in this room, you are without sin. Praise God. Positionally, you are without sin. That's the only reason you're not going to hell. Praise God. Amen. If sin was still on your account, you'd be damned. Mm -hmm. Secondly, in Christ, we are a new creation. We are a new creature, is exactly how the King James says it. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You're a new creature. Now, that's one that, again, is kind of obvious when it comes to the practical. But you see this, we have a banner that we've had up in the past. We took it down recently, so I put it up here. But it shows old things are passed away, and it looks kind of like uh, Hurricane Florence. <laughs> <laughs> but then, as in Christ, all things become new, and it looks like a beautiful day at the Niagara Falls. Uh -huh. And that's just a word picture, they call that. Mm -hmm. For spiritually speaking, that is reality for everyone who's saved. Amen. If you're in Christ, old things are passed away. All things are become new. So practically, practically, we still have our sin nature. Everyone here this morning, you still have a nature towards sin. That's why you had better be putting up walls, putting up borders, setting borders in your life, having guidelines, guarding your heart, guarding your eyes and your mind. Because if you don't, your nature will take over. Mm -hmm. And you will fall. Yes. Now, I'm just up here to tell you that just this is true about every, every pastor. I hear people say, they put some pastors like they think they're, you know, some almost a, already glorified or something. I don't care who your pastor is, if he 
starting today, lays aside God's Word, ceases his prayer life, begins tuning in to the pornography on the internet or cable or dish network or direct TV or whatever, and starts filling his mind with that stuff, he's already fallen and you will see it in his life at some point. Amen. It will, it's just like a sore that eventually will come to skin level and you'll see it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm standing up here, I'm not up here saying, I've arrived and you need to do what I do. You only need to do what I do when you see me doing what the Bible says we should do. And no matter whether it's me or you, there may be somebody in here right now who thinks you just gone, you gone, you're so close to the Lord and grown so much that you can just kind of wing it the rest of the way in and not be in the Word, not be in Bible study, and not be in prayer, and you won't fall. You've already taken your first step down into the pit. Practically, you still have a sin nature, and you'd better be in the battle. If you're not fighting your own sin nature, you're already going in the wrong direction. And positionally now, you're a child of God. In other words, your nature is wicked. But positionally, you are. Not going to be, not trying to be. You are a child of God. And you know what? God won't kick you out of the family if you fail. Whether it's sin or just a mistake you make or you just make some bad judgments or whatever, God is your Father. He's not kicking you out of the family. Positionally, you are a child of God and that's forever. But that should motivate you to want to please your Father. Amen? Amen. Thirdly, in Christ, we have eternal life. Most churches today when you take all the Protestants and, and, and Catholics or any so-called Christian church they are teaching their people that they're on probation you don't have eternal life but you could if you keep doing what you're supposed to do keep on doing all the things we tell you to do follow our sacraments Follow our statements. Do the, come to our services and give your money and give of your time and keep on keeping on and keep climbing and keep climbing. One of these days, I'm going to make it. And that's how you hear, you go to some of the churches and you'll hear the testimonies. I've heard them. Tracy, I know you've heard it. I've been traveling this road a many years and I'm going to keep going and keep climbing and keep Parting and one of these days I'm going to make it. <laughs> Climbing up the rough side of the mountain. <laughs> you know what? If you're saved, you're there. Now, practically speaking, it's one thing. But positionally, we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true and we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ, this is the true God and eternal life. Amen. You're in Christ, then you're in eternal life. Amen. He is the resurrection and the life. Right. He is eternal life. In Christ, you have eternal life. 1 John 5.13 is one that a lot of us were taught right after being saved. These things have been written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God that ye may know that you have eternal life and that ye may believe in the name of the Son of God. It says ye have eternal life. You have it. It's a present possession. It belongs to you. And it can't be taken away from you any more than someone can take away your birthday. Amen. Mm -hmm. If someone can take away your birthday, you have something to worry about, I guess. But I don't know about you, but I've had the same birthday since I was born, and you ain't going to take mine away. And that ought to be your attitude about eternal life. Don't let some heretic talk you out of it. Amen. 
You have eternal life, and you can have joy and victory if no other reason, just waking up every day and saying, I'm saved. Amen. Yep. <laughs> I'm, I have eternal life. Stock market's down. Stock market's crashing. And they're going to impeach the president. And here comes a hurricane that's going to hit Ohio. How's that? Or it's going to happen. And, you know, well, I'm saved. I have eternal life. <laughs> and listen, you know, as we're going to say here, practically, we still die physically. And practically, even beyond that, on a daily basis, we need to remind ourselves because we get caught up in what's going on in this world. We get caught up in how bad this life can be at times. And, you know, you can just enjoy the ride, even when it's rough. I'm preaching as much to myself as I am anybody. There's been times where I've just been like, this is crazy. You know? But then there's been other times where people have gotten mad at me because I'm not more upset. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, I'm sorry, but in the moment right now, I've got this thing kind of years ago when that happened. Well, it was before the wedding. So yeah, it was before, before Mariah's. And people did, I had actually had some people say, I didn't really think it was that bad. And I said, why? She said, well, you didn't seem that upset. I said, well, I was upset. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I didn't wake up and say, well, bless the Lord of blind. <laughs> hey, Martha, guess what? I'm going to have to borrow your dog. <laughs> and Martha, tell you right now, if somebody could just snap their finger and give her the ability to see, well, sure. But you know what? When I couldn't see, and, you know, I, I guess even now I get a little more upset than I did at the time, but I couldn't really see my daughter getting married. Aww. And... I had this blockage, you know, and constantly trying to look over to see, you know, and then, and, and, you know, I, I could see enough, but I just so much of what I couldn't take in. Such an important day. And I'll be honest with you now, I'll tell you, I cried a little that morning. Mm -hmm. I got a little emotional. Because so I thought, you know, uh, this is just such an important day. But then I thought, you know what? I'm still here. <laughs> I'm still going to see it, at least, <laughs> you know, enough of it. I could have just dropped dead that morning instead of not being able to see. Mm -hmm. I was able to walk her down the aisle and give her away. And you see what I'm saying? And we're going to be together forever. That is the best part of all the things I was thinking about that day. I thought, you know, this is... She's going to get married. She's going to have her family. But you know what? We're going to be together forever. And I'll have perfect vision. Forever. Yay. And she'll be all glorified. That hair will be not just long and dark and dark eyes. She's going to have hair white like wool, eyes like fire. We're going to be like Jesus. <laughs> See, that's pretty crazy. Well, I'm sorry, but that's what I was thinking of the day she got married. That's, that was going through my mind. And... Yes, we're going to die physically. But positionally, we'll never die. Amen. Now you see how it may not be exactly the same way, but that's how my mind was affected by the truth of God when I was dealing with being almost, I was legally blind and couldn't hardly see my daughter getting married. I just saw enough. But we're going to be together forever. That's how it affected me on a real basis. Positional truths affecting me in my daily walk. Mm -hmm. That's what the Bible's supposed to do to you. And no, I, I, I don't practice this as well as I should. There's times where I don't put this into practice. But when those, there's times where I have, and I'm so thankful for the positional truths that help us get through the practical daily walk. Amen? Amen. A fourth thing, in Christ, we are set apart for God. Now, that's something that we want to try to put into practice, but it's true, period. 1 Corinthians 1.20, under the church of God, which is a Corinth to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Sanctified, that means to be set apart. Called to be saints. With all that in, listen to this, 
with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. I'll say something to throw something at you, but that includes even your, the heretics. Amen. You don't go to hell for being a heretic. You know that? You can get saved and be a heretic. I've, I've been a heretic in my life a few times. Been, when I was first in the ministry, man, I, I'm glad they didn't record those messages. I mean, there's some bad stuff I've been taught, bad stuff that I relate. I was still saved. Every, it says, all that in every place call upon the name of... How many of you saw what happened in Indonesia? I mean, a lot of you may not because our news is so useless. But you can find it on there. There's a tsunami. Um, and it wasn't as bad as the one that happened what well, has been a long time ago. Yeah, it's been several years ago. But they, they showed the video, the tsunami coming in and just mm -hmm. killed a bunch of people, mm -hmm. wiped out a town. Horrible. And immediately there are Christians there ministering to people and asking for us to pray for them. And so we did. And there are people in China right now. Did you know the Chinese government's cracking down on Christians again? Uh -huh. Persecuting people just for being Christians. In Saudi Arabia, they're sending millions of dollars over here every month to build mosques in America. Not one single church is allowed to exist in Saudi Arabia. And the Christians over there are publicly flogged and imprisoned and if they persist killed for just being Christians but they're there and all of us are they're in the middle of that persecution and yet God has set them aside for himself and a lot of them that's what they'll tell you if you listen to their testimonies they'll say what gets me through is knowing that even though I'm being abused and misused by, by people here, wicked people here on earth, I belong to God. And He has set me apart unto Himself. They can kill my body, but they can't have me. Amen. Amen. You ever feel like this in the world? All the time. Yeah, I bet you do at OSU. It's a little chick that's different from you got the little yellow chickadee with uh, all the dark brown or black fuzzy uh, chicks. And there's only one little yellow one. And he's off down below looking up, all kind of alone. Mm -hmm. And that can be kind of depressing, can it? Yes. You ever been, that? been there? But what you can do is get yourself to think of, wait a minute. In the true spiritual sense, this is the way it is, and it's a good thing. Mm-hmm. I want to be set apart from this world. I want to be set aside for the Lord. And you are. Amen. If you're saved. Psalm 4, 3, this is great. But know that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. Look at that. The Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Now we already covered that. How are you godly? You're godly because you're saved. You're righteous because of Christ. And the Lord has set you apart for himself. It's kind of like the how it feels whenever you got the kids on the res you have a recess, you know, and they're picking teams and, and you got that last kid who can't dribble to save his life and Hasn't shot a good, made a good basket, a basket, and, and everybody knows he stinks, and he's the last one to be picked. And it can be kind of like, mm. well, that's how the world thinks about you. You need to wake up to that if you don't know this already. If you stand for the Lord, you're that last kid who nobody wants on their team. <laughs> it's just the truth. If you don't believe me, verbalize your faith. Just say what you believe. You believe Jesus is the only way to heaven and all the other paths lead to hell? Try saying that around some of your friends and family. <laughs> Everyone but Jesus who claims to be a Savior or Messiah is a liar. Only Jesus can save. All other religions are false. And if you're not saved, you're not born again, you'll go to hell. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, they'll love you. <laughs> Just expect homosexuality is a sin. It's a sin that you choose. Mm-hmm. Say that. Just bring it up in casual conversation with your buddies. Yeah, your family. Thanksgiving. <laughs> There's your. You wonder what you're going to talk about on Thanksgiving? Bring that up. <laughs> Most families don't get together for Halloween. Yeah. Huh? What'd you say? The NFL, no friends love. Yeah. <laughs> yes. No family love. <laughs> yeah, man. Well, and when you, you, know, you do that, you're going to be ostracized. Well, don't think of it that way. Think of well, the world's ostracizing you, but that's how God has you, and He's done it because you belong to Him. See how that works? It's kind of the it's the flip side of what the world thinks. The world, oh, I want to be cool. I want to be a part of the good. I want people to like me. I want to have a lot of friends. I want to be well. That you can be like that if you want to be fleshly, or if you want to look at things spiritually and realize that when you're taking a stand for what's right, and the world pushes you off to the side, that's exactly how God sees it too. That's exactly how you are in the eyes of God. Now, practically, you are still in this world. You have to function in this world. You go to work. You go to school. You pay your taxes. You, you know, obey the speed limit. You do all those things. But positionally, we are not of this world. You are a stranger and a pilgrim. Positionally, but are you practically? Are you a stranger and a pilgrim in this world in the eyes of the world? Now, of course, there's a right way and a wrong way of going about that. You know, but if it's because you're standing for what's right, it's because you're a Christian and you, you're not ashamed to be called a Christian. You're not ashamed to take a stand for what's right. Then you're doing it right. The fifth thing, we're going to run uh, uh, come to the end here. A couple more after this one. In Christ, we have an eternal family. An eternal family. Starts right here. Look around. That's your eternal family. Every saved person in this building right now is eternal family. You'll never get rid of me. <laughs> You're stuck with me. Romans 12, 5 says, So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Martha had her house full of them yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> of A bunch of crazy loons. Exactly. Good family. Amen? Amen. We have a good time, don't we? And Martha, you're stuck with us. <laughs> Forever and ever. What? Huh? Sound like a curse. I think you left out a few ever's there. <laughs> I mean, we we sang this. I think it's still in our book. I'm so glad I'm a part yep, it is. of the family of God. I'm Cleansed by his blood with the soldier. Grown there with Jesus as I travel this shot. Our part of the family, the family of God. Isn't that nice? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> this is the verse that that, that, that song's based on. It's, it's Ephesians 3, 14, 15. And it says, For this cause I bow my knees. Uh -huh. Under the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Hallelujah. Amen. That's why I first got turned on to history, because when I read about Christians in history, it's family. Mm -hmm. And I was reading, and I would read these stories about, like John Huss. Yeah, amen. And, and you know, Wycliffe. But pretty much the, the, the Waldensians, you know. 
And you're like, we're going to meet these people one day. They're family. And, and that makes it exciting to me. Mm -hmm. Amen. And I thought, I'd like to know a little of their story. And get there to heaven and be able to say I didn't totally ignore what you did, the price you paid, the blood shed to keep your testimony. What were you going to say, Steve? Well, you know, the Bible says that the meeting's going to be our own mansion or at least our own place in a mansion or something like that. Anyway. So it says mansion. Oh, hey, hey, in a glorified state, we'll have to see if that's necessary. But if you don't think Jesus did that, there were times where Jesus was getting off to his, his lonesome and they were chasing him. Yeah. And he didn't say, oh, come on, I, 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 I didn't mean to leave you behind. I, no, he was trying to get away from him and he did get away from him. Yeah, that's what I'm saying is that practically, practically, we, we, we don't live in the same house. We're not communists, you know, but we understand when we get together as a local church ought to, and we get together over and above that, and we enjoy our time together. It's just a taste of heaven. We are a family, and it is eternal. And I, I just love this. It, Verse saying the whole family in heaven. That's me. All those deceased saints, those who are asleep in Christ, is right. the way the Bible talks about it. Those they are up there, and when the rapture comes, uh, it takes place. Jesus is bringing on all those deceased people in their disembodied condition, and going to put a body on it. The, the dead in Christ rise first. Is talking about their bodies being lifted in a glorified state, and they're clothed in the sky with Jesus. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. Hallelujah. And that's going to be quite a family reunion. Amen? Mm -hmm. yep. And people say, well, it's not a reunion. You don't know, you haven't met a lot of those people. Well, pff, most of my family reunions I went to and met all kinds <laughs> of people I'd never met before. We were still family. Amen? Yeah. By the way, I never went there to pick up a date. <laughs> <laughs> No. Just make sure you understood that. We have stories that I won't get into. So practically, this is important. We've, Of course, this is something I'm sure we've mentioned before, but we have blood relatives. You have blood relatives. You don't claim them all, but they're there. Ancestry.com, you can find out all kinds of blood relatives you have. But positionally, we're in God's family. Amen. So now, I'm not telling you to treat people different. I'm just saying, as a matter of fact, next time you get together with your blood relatives, you need to understand something. You look around. If they're not saved, they're not in the family of God. And they're choosing, they're choosing to not be with you for eternity. Not be with the Lord and all his people for eternity. That's one of the saddest things about the, uh, some of the family gatherings I've been to is I sit there and look around and I'm thinking, and some of them are decent people, nice people, and nothing wrong with them as far as how they treat others or anything. But if you're not saved, you're not in the family of God. And I won't, I won't get this too personal, but there was somebody some years ago who died and couple of my friends and relatives stand there and I was thinking it wasn't going to say it <laughs> and one of them said we'll never see him again and that was true <laughs> never see him again that's why it sounds weird to say but you go to a funeral and somebody is saved it's wonderful Sad and wonderful at the same time. Mm -hmm. Oh, they died and we're going to miss them, but we're going to see them again. Mm -hmm. I've even told people that when I've witnessed them and said, you know what you're doing? You're not only choosing to go to hell, but this is going to be a torture for family members as long as they're on earth and they know you're lost and, even, and then when you die, it's finished. Mm -hmm. It's part of the consequences if you're not saved. 
All right, real quick. In Christ, we have liberty. Amen. Liberty. <laughs> Galatians 2, 4, we studied, said that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Hey, don't let anybody steal your liberty. Amen. And this is something Christians need to be honest about. You know, some of you listen to music that I just think is crap. And one day, I, just, I thought I was joking. I, I think I might have hurt Jenny's feelings one day. We were having a, a little uh, work day here. and I, was, I tried to joke. And I, and I should have said something later, and I got busy and didn't. But she was playing some music, and I turned it down. Just I can't remember. I turned it down, and uh, she says, oh, why are you turning it I said, because it's crap. <laughs> And sometimes I do feel that way. Um, but you know what? There's other areas where you may disagree with something that maybe I watch. Maybe you think Ben Matlock is satanic. I think you're crazy, but I, I you know, it could be. Uh, other things, some of you go to those Star Wars movies. Oh. <laughs> you know? oh. go ch Church split. <laughs> I think, I'll be honest with you, and some people are going to say, well, how could you even do it? But there's people I know who read or watch the Harry Potter stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I can't really say much about it. To be honest with you, I don't know much about it. I never read the books, never watched the movies. But I know the woman who, did, who, who wrote them was pretty wicked. And I, it's not, but you know what? If I stood up here and just started railing on, you people looking at Harry Potter, that, you know what happens? Then you come over to my house sometime and you see something on my wall, my shelf, something I'm watching. You see, we get, you got to be careful about that. Yes. There's nothing wrong with pointing out, like George Lucas. I tell people, you watch those Star Wars movies, but you understand he's pagan. Amen. And the whole force thing is real. He really believes that crap. <laughs> yeah. You know. But if you want to watch it, that's your liberty. Mm -hmm. uh, just don't expect us to see it on movie night here at BBF. <laughs> And some of this Christian music, oh. I don't think you're going to hell for listening to some of that stuff, but I just think it sounds like hell. Yeah. I played a clip in our BBF group, and it was that, I call it hell song, a hill song. It sounds like, it literally sounds like wailing and gnashing of teeth. It sounds like hell. And I don't know if any of our people actually listen to that, so I don't think I'm hurting anybody's feelings by saying that, but maybe you do. Maybe you're in the closet, you know, you're from... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I listen to bluegrass, and some people that Bob Jones University thinks that's of the devil. I'm not kidding you. I went to when she's little. We went to a Bob Jones affiliated church down in Washington Cross for a, a little while, and a guy got up and said uh, he'd gone to Steve Green concert. Says I really enjoyed that until he had the kids come forward and he started playing the banjo and playing that bluegrass Ooh. stuff. That was just uncalled for. Oh dear. <laughs> See what I'm saying? So he he think I'm a pure pagan because I listen to bluegrass gospel all the time. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is you got to be careful with that. And if you and your conscience are clear on it, of course there are things the Bible's black and white on. <laughs> but if it's something that's not black and white, it's between you and the Lord. And if you're clear on it, you don't let people tread on you. Amen. Look, it says false brethren are the ones who come in and try to spy out your liberty and bring you into bondage. Think about that. So practically, we are subject to human and natural law. There's black and white, you know, blasphemy and fornication and lying and that kind of thing. And, the, and traffic laws, believe it or not, they're not multiple choice. You know, there's things you... Well, the way people drive, they, they hate the Yeah, they do. And that's just the Christians you're talking about there. <laughs> but uh, we, we are subject to those laws practically right now. But positionally, you are free. Hallelujah. Positionally, you're free. You see, when we get into our glorified state in the millennium and all, it's not that we're going to be free to sin. It's that we are going to be so free from sin 
then we will not sin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right now, you've got that sinful nature. You, we talk about little kids, and we've got to watch. Actually, I've, I've been meaning to do this. We need to get the little covers on the owls. Because little Gloria allowed to walk in one day and decide, hey, I'm going to stick my dad's pocket knife he just laid down. I just opened up, and I'm going to stick it in there. <laughs> yeah. When we talk about kids doing that, but you, you can see it sometimes on adult Christians. You can just see them kind of walking toward that thing they shouldn't be doing. Yeah. Yeah. I did that. But again, positionally, it's good to know you're free. Got more to say about that, but we want to close up with number seven. We are as good as in heaven. <laughs> And as good as this is, I'm not talking about church. But positionally, we'll see. Look, Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Amen. That's you positionally. And also in the next chapter, Ephesians 2, 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You're sitting in heaven right now. <laughs> Even as you sit here. In other words, practically, you remain in the flesh. I love it when people say, well, I'm not uh, at... Uh, and some people say this, and it's um, they live too far away or whatever, but I'm talking about somebody who lives five minutes away, and I say, well, I, I'm not in church... It, with you in the flesh, but I'm there in the spirit. Oh dear. I'm like, first of all, don't do that. That's spooky. <laughs> if you're going to come to church, come in the flesh. <laughs> don't just be sending your spirit there. <laughs> yeah. So we remain in our flesh, and if you're going to attend church, that's the only way to attend it in the flesh. But. Yeah, that's people who, you know. But positionally, we are as good as raised and in heaven. Basically, it means this. When God says something is done, it's done. Even if it hasn't been done yet. It's a done deal. You have been raised. Your body, whether you're dead or alive, is as good as glorified and in the air right now. And you are seated in heavenly places positionally right now now how could you lose salvation when that's all oh, that's true think of what this just these seven points we talked about and there's christians out there scared to death they're going to sneeze and lose their salvation <laughs> you know how, uh, 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 you know what i mean what? oh lost it oh. let's come forward and get it again <laughs> that's not how it works because you're already sitting in heaven mm. positionally and if we feel incomplete, it is due to our failure to understand and believe God's Word. I'm telling you, I've shared these things with people, and they just look at you and say, ah, I just can't, I can't believe that. I just can't. 